Hey, good Wednesday morning, everybody. BAM weather meteorologist Brett Waltz here giving you this week's episode of Weather Yield. It's going to be a good one. A lot to talk about in this episode. We're going to talk about frost and freeze risk for this upcoming harvest. We're going to look at harvest analogs and outlooks and also going to give you a sneak peek at some of the signals that we're watching very carefully for the winter season. Almost time to talk about that as well. We'll also have updated yield analogs and those charts as we do in every episode of weather yield before we get to that i want to start out with some notes and uh, be sure you like and subscribe our youtube channel here guys because uh, we do these updates every week uh, we talk about multiple different key indicators in terms of agriculture uh, but also we'll be starting to factor in some more winter stuff as we get a little bit closer to that in today's episode we're going to talk about an update on debbie Additional heavy rainfall up the East Coast possible. I'm going to talk about an unseasonably cool pattern that's going to arrive as we go throughout this week. Wetter trends in the plains. It's been a little bit drier there. They need some rain in spots. Going to see more of that coming up. But a drier eastern ag belt. And then as we mentioned before, harvest outlooks, freeze analogs, and then a sneak peek at some winter signals. Again, guys, be sure to hit the subscribe button on our YouTube page. Along with Weather Yield, we do severe weather live streams. We do impactful weather updates. We always do a tropical update on every Tuesday, and then we do some weather education on Wednesdays. So whether you're a BAM weather client or a Clarity client, uh, or you're just a follower of ours, we try to give you some information. Of course, if you want more detailed information for your precise location, more detailed extended outlooks, be sure to scan the QR code there and inquire about our Clarity platform and our services at BAM Weather. Let's start out here with a look at rainfall totals for Debbie over the next seven days. Debbie is going to continue to slowly meander up the East Coast. We're still looking at some heavy rainfall totals, more than six inches. Uh, additionally, versus what has already fallen across parts of South Carolina, North Carolina, and then a pretty widespread area, three to five inches all the way through Virginia, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York. So some very heavy rain likely as Debbie very, very slowly moves up the East Coast. Oftentimes when you get these tropical systems that move up the East Coast directly west of them, directly west of the track, tends to be a little bit drier, we're seeing that this week with dry conditions for the most part across the Southern Plains, the Tennessee Valley, Deep South, and into parts of the Great Lakes and the Eastern Ohio Valley. In terms of the past seven days, uh, some heavy rain across Minnesota, Eastern South Dakota, Wisconsin. You can kind of see the primary storm track that we've dealt with over the past seven days. Number one, this area late last week across parts of Illinois, Indiana, and into Kentucky. And then early this week across parts of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan and into parts of Ohio and the northeastern part of the country. Parts of Ohio and Pennsylvania definitely needed that rain, but still some spots that missed out across southern Ohio, Virginia, and West Virginia that are still dealing with some drought conditions down there. Further off to the west, Nebraska, western Iowa, parts of Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, these are areas that have been drier. And if we look at the past 14 days, many of these areas across the western and the southwest plains have been a good bit drier than normal. You can very clearly see the storm track from the upper Midwest through parts of the Great Lakes and the Ohio Valley. Still some spots in there that missed out. It's common when we get these storm cluster type of patterns that there will be some spots that get missed out based on where they track. But the more widespread dryness the last 14 days has been, again, across the Western Plains. The good news is if we look at the rainfall over the next seven days, while there are some model differences, I should say next 10 days, does look like it's going to be more active, more rainfall opportunities for the Western Plains. Now, I continue to think that the GFS model, if you're doing training and you're looking at the markets, the GFS model has consistently been too dry as of late. I continue to see struggles with that model. I would take it with a grain of salt right now. And if we take a look here over the next 10 days, you can see the European quite a bit heavier across South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, and parts of Illinois. I am in more agreement with the European model compared to the GFS. I think the GFS is too dry in spots across parts of the Western Plains. So should be some relieving moisture in there possible as we work over the next 10 days. In terms of just our week one and our week two forecast, again, favoring the European model, the next seven days should be some decent rain opportunities, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, maybe Missouri. And then as we go through this week two timeframe, we should start to see this storm track pick back up 
from the northern plains through the midwest and into the ohio valley should be more rain opportunities in here as we go through this week two time frame but i want to make the note areas further down to the south southern plains oklahoma texas kansas these are areas that probably average out drier than normal and especially across oklahoma and texas not a lot of moisture over the next seven days either and so that's an area that will likely grow increasingly dry as we work over the next two weeks it's also going to be hot down there we take a look at temperatures uh, this is today in terms of high temperatures record-breaking heat possible down across texas temperatures 106 108 degrees extremely hot down there even for this time of the year but then the further north you go the upper midwest look at the northern plains temperatures not getting out of the 70s today and that is not a one day thing we kind of go through here this is friday even cooler on friday maybe even some record breaking cool temperatures look up here across northern minnesota northern michigan temperatures not getting out of the mid to low 60s up here and widespread 70s for the corn belt as we go into early next week slowly start to warm up a little bit but still for the middle of august this time of the year temperatures in the upper 70s to low 80s for many across the midwest very very nice conditions for this time of the year while heat continues down across oklahoma and Texas. Here's how things average out over the next two weeks. Cooler than normal temperatures over the next seven days, as we talked about. We do slowly start to warm up in week two. I think especially kind of the 16th to the 20th of the month, more widespread warmer than normal temperatures will build in. Core of the heat will be across the southern plains. And again, just given recent model biases, if there's a risk, it's probably still a little bit cooler in this region in here if there's any trend to watch but overall i do think that the pattern can be a little bit warmer as we work towards the midway point of august and beyond taking a look at soil moisture right now there's a lot of corn in these areas that are that you see the blues which basically means above normal soil moisture basically all of this area in here and again a lot of corn in here dealing with normal to above normal soil moisture right now Areas that have trended drier over the last few weeks, Kansas, western Nebraska, the western plains, we talked about this a few weeks ago, that this was an area we were a little bit concerned about in terms of some dryness expanding, and that has certainly happened the past two weeks. The good news is, uh, related to Debbie's influence and that stronger cold front, some of these areas will cash in on some much-needed rain over the next 7 to 10 days. Now, in terms of fall, Let's start talking about this. We did some research over the weekend looking at some of our top analogs 2017, 2013, 2011, 2005, and 2001. Right now, top five running analogs as we work into this fall. These dates here represent when the first 32 degree freeze happened. You see a lot of orange on this table. Most of these analogs, really aside from 2001, had later than normal first freezes for a lot of these big cities, Peoria, Columbus, Des Moines, Fargo, Omaha, Indy, Kansas City, Minneapolis, St. Louis, Sioux Falls, and Wichita, kind of covering vast majority of the Ag Belt there. Almost all of them, again, averaged out later than normal for that first freeze, really aside from Wichita. That'd be the only spot that could be a little bit earlier than normal, and in some cases, much later than normal. A lot of these recent weak La Nina or cool neutral years like 2017 had a much later than normal first freeze. I would say indications right now as a whole would suggest that we're going to deal with a later than normal first freeze and probably frost as well for the vast majority of the Ag Belt. If we take a look at these analogs and I added in 2016 as well as a sixth analog based off the weekly Enzo indications that I'm seeing right now are running somewhat close to 2016. It came off of a strong to Super El Nino just like this year, so I did throw it into the mix. doesn't really change the forecast. It's a hotter than normal one, especially across the central part of the country uh, as we go throughout fall, September through November. In terms of precipitation, uh, drier to the south. That'll be something I think we need to keep an eye on is when does this actually develop because I could see this area being wetter in September related to tropical activity and then trending drier down there across the cotton belt in October and November as we kind of get past the peak climatology of hurricane season. Uh, I do think that as we go throughout fall, that there can be a little bit more of a La Nina-like storm track at times through the northern plains, 
and then across the Ohio Valley in the Midwest. I'll also make a note, some of these years, 2017, 2013, did deal with some late season severe weather. Fall is kind of the secondary severe weather season. That would not shock me across the Midwest and the Ohio Valley this fall if we see a little bit of that. Now, with that being said, I do want to mention a risk that I'm keeping a very close eye on, and that is where exactly does our La Nina set up? Right now, favoring kind of a cool neutral to very weak La Nina. In general, years that have the coolest ocean waters more in the central Pacific near the dateline tend to be hotter as a whole. Years that keep the coolest air closer to South America or an East Pacific La Nina tend to be a little bit cooler. And so I think maybe a risk to watch in here would be a cooler risk, especially later in fall across the north central part of the country. Uh, again, I, I don't think this is the be all end all. I think this probably matters more into winter than fall as well, but a risk at the very least to keep an eye on. I also think that there's something to be said in terms of precipitation for these years. There are some differences. Uh, again, the Central Pacific Nina years look pretty similar to our outlook. They're drier, if anything, as a whole, even a little bit further to the north, while East Pacific years tend to be a little bit cooler and a little bit wetter across the plains and across the eastern ag belt. So something to keep in mind there. If you want some dry time to really get harvest done, the Central Pacific La Nina years, which again, a little bit closer to our outlook right now, tend to favor more dry time. I also think there's something to be said just about recent climatology, recent history, looking at the last five weak La Nina or cool neutral years in fall specifically, overall favors a hotter than normal pattern and a drier than normal pattern, aside from maybe the Northwest Plains. And so, you know, I think overall this is more where we're leaning right now. Here's where our harvest outlook currently stands. I, I think, again, especially probably early in fall, warmer than normal across much of the northern and the western plains, the mountain west. At times, maybe there can be some cold fronts that impact the eastern ag belt, maybe some more ups and downs for the Ohio Valley, and subsequently with that, probably a little bit more active as well for Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and into parts of Michigan but drier across the plains and down through the Tennessee Valley. A couple of these years, 2016, for example, I believe it was, uh, had some drought conditions across the eastern Tennessee Valley. It led to some wildfire issues. So that'll be something to keep an eye on into fall as well. In terms of what these years would indicate in terms of yields, and I, I want to make a note, guys, we're at the, the point of the season where we also kind of need to factor in where we've been, but these are close enough, uh, I think, to reality that they are usable for yield analogs. 17, 16, 13, 11, 05, and 01 overall average out 1.7 above trend line. Uh, and so 1.7 bushels above trend line there. Uh, if anything, wouldn't be shocked if it's even a little bit higher than that, uh, given how active it was to start the season and really the lack of heat at times throughout the ag belt. In terms of soybeans, these also average out a little bit above normal. I will note a couple of years in here, 2013, 2011, which were a little bit drier. August and then September were a little bit lower. I think these are probably too low, but something to keep an eye on. It's been dry across the eastern ag, or it's going to be dry across the eastern ag belt first 10-ish days or the next 10-ish days or so. So that is something at least to keep an eye on in terms of soybeans, but still averaging out above normal. Real quick before we go, Let's talk about some winter signals. This is the fun part of the forecast, looking out six, seven months out ahead of time. Uh, at least just interesting to kind of take a look at some things. Uh, this is the NMME. It's kind of a multi-model ensemble of different American data. You can see the cooler than normal ocean waters along the equator. Note how it's kind of basin wide, cooler than normal from South America all the way out to the dateline. Uh, not really east-based or west-based necessarily, it's basin wide. Why is that important? Because these years in general that are more eastern based um, to basin wide tend to be a little bit cooler. And if you look at its forecast, this particular model's forecast for winter, it's cooler. Uh, it kind of suppresses the warmth more down to the south, has some cooler air. This would be a more active storm track and more snow opportunities for the Midwest and the Ohio Valley, certainly compared to recent years. On the flip side, the EPS seasonal, Note how it actually, if anything, has some warmer than normal ocean waters just off the coast of South America. It's more central to western based with the La Nina. 
these years tend to be warmer as a whole. You take a look at its winter forecast, it reflects that. It is a very, very warm winter forecast right now from the European seasonal model. Uh, if we take a look at just different years, there were four that I could kind of separate in terms of weak La Niña's as we head into winter. The top left are the more basin-wide to eastern Pacific ones, 96, 97, 01, and 18. And the ones on the bottom are the more central-based ones. You can see the purple there, closer to the date line, 06, 09, 17, and 23. Those years would be the, the back half of winter. So it would be 05, 06, 08, 09, so on and so forth. If we look at these years, you can very clearly see the differences. If we are a weaker central Pacific La Nina, it's going to be warmer. If we are a, a weaker eastern base La Nina, it opens the door for a colder and a snowier winter. Right now, I would say it's not set in stone one way or the other. We've been more eastern based, but the trend over the past few weeks has been to shift things a little bit further off to the west. So maybe we're somewhere in between the two right now, if anything. And if you have clarity, we do have our official preliminary outlook there on the Clarity platform and on BAMWX.com. I'm not going to share it here yet. We'll talk more about this in coming weeks, but this, I think, is the big thing to watch. Where does the La Nina set up? Is it more towards the Dateline? Is it more towards South America? I think, ultimately, that'll be one of the biggest drivers for the upcoming winter. Again, for more details, scan the QR code. Uh, again, we have our preliminary winter forecast there on our Clarity platform for temperatures. And of course, guys, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more updates as we go throughout the week and for next week's episode of Weather Yield. Appreciate your all's time. Thank you for watching. Hope to talk to you soon.